in large corporate facilities, small boutique wineries, and custom crush operations. She is highly experienced in all aspects of winemaking, but has a passion for unraveling wine analyses, connecting data, and quality improvement. So with that, Maggie, I will give you the floor. Please take it away. Oh, thank you, Andrea, for having me here today. As I was telling you before we got going, I, I'm excited and I love enzymes. Um, the first time I encountered enzymes really was when I was an enologist. And we were doing a very, um, we were working with another company who was helping us extract more tannin. So we'd get a bigger, brighter red Cabernet Sauvignon style wine. And um, <clears throat> at the same time, the winemaker had never used the Scottsdale Color Pro, but she had used Scottsdale KS for filtration. And um, well, there's a story where the Scottsdale KS got added to the red must grapes accidentally. And that is where at first I thought I hated enzymes. Um, but then once we picked another lot to do the trial on, I saw some differing results and I saw what they can do for us. So my goal here today is to just kind of demystify what enzymes are <clears throat> so that everybody has a good understanding where they're going to use them, how they work and why they're cho choosing certain enzymatic profiles. So Jumping off, we've got to start with our foundation, the basics. So we'll start there and then we will go ahead and jump into pectin structure and enzyme activities, enzyme and juice and wine. And uh, hopefully by the end of this, you'll all have a better idea about enzymes. So the basics, what are enzymes? What is pectins? Why we like enzymes and what can they do for us? Where do our pectinase enzymes come from? I'm starting with this because there tends to be kind of a, a fearful idea about enzymes. And I want to let you guys know they're, they're nothing to be scared of. So enzymes basically are proteins. I underline the word proteins because this is very important fact about enzymes. This will come into play in your order of operations. Just understanding that they're proteins will help you make some very important decisions as to um, the order of operations when you add them. Um, they act as a biological catalyst by accelerating chemical reactions. We in the wine industry, we, um, we use enzymes known as pectic enzymes or enological enzymes. Also, they're known as pectinase and guess what? They break down pectin. So if we go to our winemaking Bible, what is a pectin? The definition in the principles and practices of winemaking is a complex polysaccharide. Here I've underlined another word that I think we need to keep in mind. It's a polysaccharide. It involves the lacturonic acid, it's methyl ester and other sugar derivatives. Pectin contributes to viscosity. Okay, viscosity, we'll talk about that later. And sometimes hazes of must and wines. They're shortened and solubilized by pectinase enzymes. Okay, so that's the textbook version, but really what are pectins? <clears throat> pectins are polysaccharides and they're holding the grape together. So to visualize this, I have our lovely little grape right here. All the goodies are what is inside that we wanna make good wine. <clears throat> so we look at the grape and we know that these simple pectin chains, so this is a pectin chain. You're gonna see this a lot throughout the slideshow because I refer to it a lot. There's a lot of information here. And this is a more complex pectin chain. These pectin chains can either clog the surface of your filter media or they can pass right through and then cause a haze in your wine. Um, they're easily remedied with the use of enzymes. Another way I kind of like to think about pectins is when we have a ton of these little pectin chains, right? We create a pectin net in our tank, trapping all our solid particles. When we have a heavy pectin load, it's hard to settle that tank of wine. So we like enzymes because basically what they do is they're gonna cut up that pectin chain and they're gonna help us settle tanks, but they're also gonna cut, cut up the pectin chain so we can get all the juice, the pulp, the precursors um, for aromatics and color. <clears throat> but once we cut up the pectin chain and we get all the release of that juice and pulp, <clears throat> there's still pectin around, right? And so 
that pectin is trapping or it's keeping everything in suspension in our tank. So if we're trying to settle our juice tank right before we pitch yeast, depending upon the harvest, you can have a heavier pectin load and you might notice that your tank isn't settling. Also, you might get a nice settled juice tank depending on the pectin load, but even in wine, we, we might get to the wine phase and we go to make a fining agent add and you'll see that things are not dropping out. Now there's quite a few scenarios that can keep things up in solution, but one of the main things are our heavy pectin loads. And um, so yeah, again, keep solids and other colloids in suspension um, and aids clarification and settling. That's what our enzymes do. Enzymes also, like I said, I repeat myself a lot, foul the filter surface causing filtration enzymes and cause polysaccharide haze in the wine phase. So where do our pectinase enzymes come from? They're from a fungal origin. Um, most of our pectinase enzymes come from our friend Aspergillus niger. Some people get scared about that. We'll talk about it a little later. Um, and our other friend Trichoderma harzianum. It's really important that you pay attention to your code of federal regulations. Our code is CFR 2724.246. Anything listed under this code of federal regulations can be added to your wine and then can be exported to the European market. You'll also see some other um, enzymes from fungal origin like Bacillus lichenformis and Aspergillus eculitis, but most of the majority of the enzymes that you're going to use for winemaking are probably going to come from these two, two um, fungal organs. So this is where I try and help you guys understand they're nothing to be scared of. Where do we see these, these um, fungal fungus? Aspergillus niger and Trichoderma hazianum are all over our daily lives. So if you've ever picked up an onion and it's got this lovely little moldy dust on it, it's probably Aspergillus niger. Same with our citrus fruit. And what's funny is today I went to have an orange and look what I got. <laughs> um, and then Trichoderma has harzianum is very prevalent in dirt. Um, uses of Aspergillus niger and Trichoderma harzianum and their derived enzymes in other industries. All right, so I always, I, I can just read this off, right? So preparation of citric acid and gluconic acid, you know, for flatulence, I have a boss who loves beans and I'm constantly bringing her beano. Not that she has a problem, but it's just kind of a joke. But yeah, our friend Aspergillus niger um, makes alpha galactosidase for us so that we can eat beans without being stinky. It's pretty cool. Um, they're also a source of natural food grade pigments, solubilization of metals. Trichoderma harzianum is used to produce cellulase and enzyme activity. And you'll see up here, alpha galactosidase, that's also an enzyme activity. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, Trichoderma is used to help control plant disease. And if you are a child of the 90s, like me, 80s and 90s, and you loved your stonewashed denim, well, hey, Trichoderma harzianum is our friend and helped us get our cool stone wash denim jeans. All right, so now we're going to get into um, the pectin structure, but I think these two slides help you understand that enzymes aren't anything to be fearful of. They're, we use them in our everyday lives. They're all around us, especially Aspergillus niger. Um, a lot of people call up and ask me, hey, Maggie, I I'm scared of enzymes. I, I don't want to use them. Aspergillus niger, I hear that causes black, black lung. <laughs> yes, it can, but you have to be exposed to a lot. You have to have a weakened immune system. And we're not, we're, we're taking the enzyme activity from Aspergillus niger. So I, I want people to really understand they're not something to be feared of. Um, I actually got to visit the plant in France where, um, a lot of our enzymes come from. And it is, it's like a very serious thing. They take the production of enzymes very serious. They, nobody comes in or out willy nilly. You are background checked. You have a special card. Um, they, they take it very seriously and, and it is serious, right? You know, we're, we're making um, a product that goes into food. We, we don't mess around with that. So, our, our industry enzymes are nothing to be feared. 
So let's talk about pectin structure. Um, to do that, we kind of need to know pectin and enzyme nomenclature. We're going to do a reminder of what is trapping the juice, um, pectin, obviously, but I, I kind of restate these ideas again and again. I, I beat them into your head. <clears throat> then we're gonna look at that same um, diagram that we looked at before, a basic pectin chain versus um, a more complex pectin chain with side chain activities. And then the activities needed to cut the, the chain. So let's move on. Pectic enzyme nomenclature, it's really easy. Enzyme activity, pectinase, works on pectin. Cellulase, works on cellulose. Polygalacturonase, what a mouthful, works on homogalacturonin. Arabinase, works on arabin. <clears throat> All right, so where do we see these cool things? This is a cross-section of the grape. And right down here is the pulp. From the pulp, we typically get what we call our simple pectin chain. It's a homogalacturonin. So guess what? We're using polygalacturonase. That's one of the enzyme activities that we're using to break up this chain. We're using pectin methylesterase and pectin lyase. And over here, this little orange dot right here. Oh, you guys can't see it. I'm, I'm poking on my screen instead of the screen you guys are looking at. But this little orange dot right here is a ramnogalacturonin. Um, and then it's cut off by romnogalactronase. So just know that if you are dealing with simple pectin chains, you need an enzyme with these activities. As we get closer to the skin, we start to see more complex pectin chains with what we call these hairy side regions. And your, your typical pectinase enzymes, pectin lyase, pectin methylase, if they're not gonna break these hairy structures off. Um, so just know you're going to think about there's there's two places we use enzymes, right? We use it in juice at the grape to macerate and get the goodies out. And then you're going to use it later if necessary in the wine phase for different reasons. And we'll get into that later. <clears throat> but know if you have a warmer than usual year it might be that even if you don't use harvest enzymes, it might be that you're getting more of these hairier regions and you're having a hard time settling because you've got your simple pectin chain and your more complex pectin chain creating your pectin net, net in your tank. So you're gonna have to think about the harvest, what you're trying to get out of the enzyme, what activity you need. Like I said, hotter, longer harvests seem to produce more difficult, complex pectin chains to break down. We had a very hot harvest last year. And I mean, I live in Petaluma, California. So we're right on the coast. I moved back to my hometown because we get a nice fog in Florence every evening. Well, this year, for the first time that I can remember in 45 years, um, it was 115 in Petaluma. We typically don't get hotter than 102, 106. I've lived here my whole life. And this harvest all around Sonoma and Napa County, there were just a lot of different issues that came up with all the heat spikes. And settling was one of them for more than just pectin issues. But that was definitely one of the issues. All right, I'm kind of rambling. So we're going to move on. So let's look at enzyme activity. Um, and what, what these enzymes work on. So <clears throat> this is just kind of to show you another view. So here we have our simple pectin chain. Your simple pectin chain is going to need these typical simple pectinase activities. We use this in settling and clarification. If we end up using something in the pre-fermentum step for pressing or extraction and maceration, we're gonna need some cellulase and hemicellulase activities, right? We wanna get through those skins or get up under the skins, right? So let's look at our um, Sauvignon Blanc. A lot of people like to use a press enzyme when they go to, to make Sau Blanc because it helps them get under those skins and break the skins and get more juice and get those aromatic precursors. In red, very, simple, easy reason we like enzymes is to get more color. Um, and then if you get further along, let's say you're in post-fermentum steps, we've got different enzyme activities for
for different things, right? If you're having difficulty filter, or you see a haze that's not going away, that's not a protein haze, um, you may need an enzyme to resolve that problem. And that enzyme, you're going to want a little bit of everything in that enzyme to take care of all the possible um, um, pectin issues. Um, aroma release, we use what's called a beta or a glycosidase, right? So that's going to release your bound um, your, your bound aromatics. Um, we just did a trial this year for our Santa Rosa um, Win Industry trade show. And I went and got a nice Malvasia from one of our favorite wineries. And he was gracious enough, gracious enough to give me about 15 gallons. And I dosed three tanks and, or three kegs and, or I dosed two kegs. And it was really cool. It was really cool to take the wine to the show and just show people how with a little bit of enzyme at the end of a wine's life, you can still kind of pop more aromatics and pop more life into it. And then we talk about aging on the leaves. Let's say we have some red wine that we need to get to market early. Go ahead and add an enzyme that's going to help kind of um, break up that yeast cell wall and release all those yummy nanoproteins and all the other yeast goodies that, that contribute to mouthfeel and stability. So this is just kind of a general big picture. Later on, we'll revisit different sections of this graphic to kind of just talk about it again. So enzymes and juice, remember, why do we use enzymes? We use enzymes to cut up the pectin chain, right? In the harvest stage, we're trying to extract more juice, increase our yield, get more color, get more aromatic precursors in the wine phase to deal with problem filtrations, to increase aromatics, or to just... Um, get more goodies out of our yeast cells. So we're gonna talk about how enzymes work, the order of operations with finding agents and their interactions. Um, and then we'll look at different process steps in the winemaking world where you can implement enzymes. We're gonna talk about something that's near and dear to my heart called glucans. I can't say it's dear to my heart, but it's something that arises a lot regularly and they're just a stickier pectin and what we have to do to remedy them. And then we're gonna go over the concerns with the enzymes. So we just talked about it, where are enological enzymes needed and used? You guys have seen this enough. I think we'll just move on through. How enzymes work. This is really important. Enzymes take time, the temperature is important and the amount of enzymes. So I call it TAC. Time, amount of the enzyme, and temperature. <clears throat> and then we're also going to look at the enzyme interactions and the timing of your enzyme act. So TAT. Okay, Maggie, what, what does that all mean? So I'm just going to kind of talk freely here with this slide up. I stole this from um, one of our vendors. He was grateful. Uh, he was gracious enough to share with me some, some enzyme slides. But let's just look at simple scenario. You have your Sauvignon Blanc in and you want it to go to flotation, right? And you wanna chill that juice down. You wanna keep it cold so we don't kick off fermentation. So what you're gonna need is you're gonna need an enzyme that can handle really cold, cold juice settling temperatures, right? You also want this done quickly. So if you want it done quickly and you're in cold temperatures, increase that dose to the max rate, get a full depectinization. You need this full depectinization to, for, for the juice to float. If there's any pectin present, you can't do the flotation process. I'm not gonna go into the flotation process, but that's something that a lot of people need full depectinization and that's a whole other presentation that I'm not gonna talk about because I'm not equipped to. But it's quite serious in our big winemaking facilities. Um, even if you're just juice settling, I had somebody call recently and, it's way past harvest and they let me know my enzyme that we sold them didn't work. And I said, what? well, wait a minute, wait a minute. What, what enzyme did you use? And what was your tank temperature at? When they said, well, we chill our juice at 40 degrees Fahrenheit. And I said, mm, the enzyme you used can't work under those conditions or it does work, but it works really slow. So you chose the wrong enzyme for the job. 
And they were really disappointed. Well, but it says it's for juice. Yes, it does. But let's, let's look at the text sheet. Let's look at the parameters. I'm sorry you had this bad experience. Um, let's work on it. Another client calls up and says, Maggie, your enzyme didn't work. Again, I go through the temperature, what enzyme they chose. And then I asked, so did you use any finding agents to help find your juice? Oh yeah, we added betonite at the same time. Oh, okay, we're gonna jump into that later. But remember that little underlined word protein, enzymes are proteins, keep that in mind. Um, so Tat, I think we've covered it. The timing of the addition, I always say the sooner the better. Um, the temperature and contact time is big. And then other criteria, our finding agents, our harvest ads, and then the dose, right? If you want an enzyme to work quick, warm temperature, max dose. If you have a lot of time, medium dose, medium temperature. If you have a long time, low dose, medium temperature. Cold temperatures, there's only a few enzymes that are really um, designed for extreme cold temperatures. So go back and forth with that. Enzyme ads are not great during cold stabilization. Try and get those enzymes that in enzyme additions in before you go to cold stabilize your wine or at juice settling. Maybe don't go down to 40. So let's talk about enzyme interactions. Bentonite. So this client was wonderful and provided me um, the information to help them understand why the enzyme didn't work. They added enzyme with bentonite. Guess what? Bentonite we use for protein heat stabilization. It deactivates enzyme. It binds it up. The other thing that binds um, that binds protein um, are tannins. But there's some wiggle room on this, and I am not equipped to speak highly on tannins. But there's this sacrificial tannin theory. And so we use tannins in harvest to bind up proteins in the juice. So I think the main thing is don't add your enzymes when you're, if you're doing a, a tannin ad, right? Not at the same exact time, just space them out. We know that enzymes are being added to grapes. Grapes have a tannin and guess what? The enzymes are still working. But if you're making a tannin ad, that's a super concentrated ad addition before it gets homogenized through the mess. And now you've got a super concentrated enzyme addition. If you put them at the same time, they could potentially deactivate each other. So don't do that. Order of operations is important. Um, the other thing to be mindful of is our finding agent friends. Some of our finding agents are blended with bentonite. So it's really important if you choose a finding agent or you're recommended a finding agent, make sure you get the text sheet, make sure you understand if you are using enzymes, when and where the best time is to make that ad. So we've got um, finding agents that are PVPP and bentonite. We've got finding agents that are bentolact and bentonite. Um, there's some non-allergenic finding agents, pea protein and potato protein that can sometimes be blended with bentonite. So it's really important that whatever finding agent you're using, that you understand, is it blended with bentonite or is it pure? Um, let's move on. So my mantra to everybody is always enzymes first. Um, first of all, if you're using them before a finding agent, your finding agent's gonna be more effective, right? So you're trying to reduce viscosity, you're trying to reduce stickiness. If the finding agent has to fight through all that turbidity to find its target, it, you have to use more finding agent. Um, also, and this is an example. So this is a wine, it's a pear cider that a client sent to me back in 2012. And they wanted me to find with Isinglass because they were told that it was a good idea. And, and I knew right away that Isinglass wasn't gonna cut it. That's, Isinglass can't deal with this type of um, turbidity. It's not what it's meant for or designed for. So I, I did what the client asked. And then I went ahead and used our Scottsyme HC and Scottsyme PEC-5L together. And I also did our gelatin trial with some silica gel. And you can see, so here, sorry, I'm pointing at the wrong slide. Here's our control. 
Here is our enzyme treated um, pear cider and our gelatin treated pear cider. Both of these worked. This created quite a thick sedimentation down at the bottom of the bottle and this a little bit less. And now if the client wants to use Isinglass for crystal clear brilliance, now's a good time to use Isinglass, but not before. It's just not a strong enough finding agent. He didn't want to use gelatin because he didn't want to disrupt any of the sensory aspects. But I needed to show him that you could use enzymes some people, this is another aspect, some people get a little stressed out about, oh my gosh, it's going to ruin my sensory. I've worked at Scott Labs for 16 years. I have not had one client use an enzyme and call me up and say it destroyed their aromatic sensory or their mouthfeel sensory. They just don't, they might impart a little bit, right? Right. That one enzyme we talked about are like a glycosidase. Um, yes, that does disrupt the sensory, but it pushes it in a more favorable direction. And you can actually dial that impact up or down based on dose and time. And when you stop that enzymatic reaction with guess what, that night, <laughs> right? So if you want to stop an enzyme activity, just go ahead and add a little bentonite to your blend. So back to the slide. I think this perfectly illustrates, this is a case for enzymes. If we wanna go in and use Isinglass later, that's perfect. Oftentimes, enzyme ads are a lot easier than making up your finding agent and they do just as good a job and you may not need that finding agent. Um, making up enzymes, they come in two different, um, they come two ways, they either come in a liquid or they come in granular and all you do is dissolve them in water. That's it, and make your ad, very easy. A lot better than, um, fluffing up Isinglass, um, better than waiting five to six hours for casein and PVPP to fluff up properly. So I'm always an enzyme first girl, trial it. Um, also, if you do need to add bentonite, you got to do the enzyme portion first. I hate it when somebody calls me up and says, hi, Maggie, um, my bentonite's not settling. Just out of curiosity, client, did you use any enzyme in this juicer, Ryan? Nope. Should I do that now? No, you can't do it now. You've got bentonite stuck up in the wine column or juice column. So this is the primary reason I'm an enzyme first girl. You can't do some of the other finding agents. If, the, if they're not settling, they're not settling. It's, you've obviously got something going on. You probably have a heavy pectin load or you might have a microbial something going on, creating a lot of CO2 and keeping things up in suspension. So um, if, if we can do the enzymes first, then we've reduced the noise as to why a finding agent isn't settling. And oftentimes when people do enzymes first, they don't have the problem anymore. Okay, so enzymes and processing. In fruit, we use enzyme for macerating, extraction, and just general depectinization. Um, you can add enzymes at the crush and distemper if you want. Here's something to be mindful of, right? Do we add enzymes or do we add tannin? You're gonna have to make that decision. Some harvest trials are needed. If you're at the crush or distemper and you add an enzyme, don't add a tannin at the same time. Same thing in the press. If you add a tannin at the crusher to stemmer, it might be too soon to add it to the press. It just depends on your volume and how long it takes for you to load your press. There's, you know, I work with some really big, big facilities and when they're loading their press, it takes eight hours to load their press, um, anywhere from five to eight hours. So be mindful of where you are in the process. So. I have a lot of clients who just want to get the enzyme in as quick as they can, and they'll they'll add it at the pressure and distemmer and rinse everything down going into the press. Um, especially for some of our harder, thick skins, a press enzyme is really important. It helps you get at all the extra juice. I shouldn't say extra. It helps you get to the juice, right? Those thick skins are really hard to break up sometimes, and you need some of that cellulase activity to get in there. 
And then we've got people who skip enzymes at the dish stemmer or crush. They go crush and they press and they go right into their, their tank with either skins or not skins. This is another time you can add an enzyme. Um, if you don't have skins, you just probably need, if it's a, a nice neutral harvest, not too hot, things aren't too slimy and goopy, maybe you can get away with a simple pectinase. Um, if it's a hot harvest or your grapes have been sitting in a gondola or getting trucked across the country, you might need something with more enzyme activity than just that simple pectinase because you've had time to get more of the goodies underneath the skin. Remember the skin's the hairy region pectinase. It's that, that complex pectin chain. So in juice depectinizing, this is for flotation or just wanting to reduce solids, percent solids, so you can dial in your fermentation, right? Different fermentation um, or different goals require us to have different percent solids or different turbidities. So enzymes are another way you can do that. Um, this is important, post-firm, post-malolactic fermentation, yeast cell wall breakdown, and glucans. We're going to talk about glucans later, but glucans come from botrytis, and they also come from some of our microbial friends. Um, sorry. Um, yeast cell wall breakdown. If you want the goodies, you really want to use an enzyme that can break down the cell wall. And cell walls tend to have a glucan in there as well. So you're gonna need kind of a potent enzyme. If you're dealing with glucans, you're gonna need a lot of time to deal with them. Filter and preparation pre-bottling. Oh, this is a topic I talk about daily with people every single day. Maggie, my cross flow filter is not working. Did you use enzymes? Nope. Should I be? Yes. You guys have to realize there are different types of filtration, right? So we've got our pressure relief filtration where we build a cake with DE and perlite and cellulose fiber. Then we've got our plate and frame or lenticular that's called depth. But those are both called depth media filtration. And then we have sterile filtration, which is a membrane. Cross-flow filtration is a marriage of both. Um, and that's something we can talk about later. But if you have any microbial, high microbial blooms, anything sticky like pectins or glucans, you're not gonna go through your cross-flow. Um, pectins and glucans are not gonna go through a sterile membrane. You can filter with depth filtration, pectins and glucans, um, but it's difficult. And oftentimes, you're, if, if it's a pad filtration or a lenticular filtration, you're just switching out the media. If it's pressure relief filtration, DE Velo filtration, you're just constantly building a cake because those pectins and glucans are coating the surface of your filter media. So I like people, especially in big facilities. So I used to work at a custom bottling facility. I wish I had known now what I I. I wish I'd known then what I know now. I can't tell you how many times we, and this was 20 years ago, we, we got to day of bottling, we got through our Velo DE filtration, and then we get to the day of bottling and boom, we're stuck. We've got four, we've got two wines going and we've got four wines in the chute waiting to go, right? Everything's just boom, boom, boom. It's like a domino effect. So, if you are not pectin and gluten free, you're not going to be able to get through that sterile membrane filter. And a lot of people don't like the sterile membrane filter. That's another conversation. I, I did a lot of microbial work in my undergrad. I maintained the microbe um, petri dishes for Sonoma State University, or I helped. Um, I love microbes. They're our friends, but there is a time and a place for them. And in your wine, in a bottle, not the best time. Our friends, I go Saccharomyces, um, they make explosions out of bottles. And our friend Bertenomyces, they can give off lovely aromatics, but they can also destroy your wine. And microbe populations increase and decline. So in your bottle, you might have that happening. And you don't want that happening in your bottle if you can help it. So in my world, sterile filtration, 
To ease your sterile filtration or your cross flow filtration, add a pectic enzyme at the minimum. If you know you have other issues in the vineyard or high microbials, you may need a, glucan, a gluconase enzyme. Um, so we kind of have already gone through this, but I wanted you guys a, a quick reminder, right? If you're just settling juice, you need some simple enzyme. If you wanna really clarify your juice, you need your simple enzyme activities and some side chain activities. If you wanna press or extract aromatic goodies or macerate your skins, you're gonna need a complex enzyme. Um, improving filtrability, I've already rambled on about that. Um, so again, a more complex um, enzyme and that's gonna lead us into our glucan talk. Glucans, a stickier polysaccharide. So interesting, um, if you have grapes with botrytis and you try to filter that, that wine made from those grapes, here's a picture of our clean PES, our polyether cell phone sterile membrane. And here is our polyether cell phone membrane fouled with glucan from botrytis. Nothing's gonna get through that, right? You just coated it. Where else do glucans come from? Well, over here, if you can see my cursor, our little friend Pediococcus, here it is again, kicks out glucan. So last year I had three red wines come in that were giving um, the winemakers difficulties cross-flowing. So I said, all right, how was the fruit? Well, two of the red wine makers said, ah, uh, so this was a winemaker in Washington and a winemaker in California, totally separate companies. We purchased this red wine off the bulk market. Okay, so we don't know the back history. We only know what we got. We don't know if that was a botrytis fruit issue. Um, the other red wine maker in California, oh, we've had this wine from beginning to end. Okay, great. So I asked the winemakers, can you guys get scorpions on them? Lo and behold, all three came back with pediococcus. Two of them came out with really high pediococcus um, levels. And one of them was just low. So the winemaker said, oh, it's not a pediococcus issue. And I said, well, you can't say that. We took a scorpion right now. We took a genetic test right now. And that is a snapshot of what the wine is right now. Remember, our microbial populations can boom and bust, right? They go up and down. So right now you might have a low pediococcus um, level in that wine, but you don't know what that level was six months ago. You could have had that pediococcus bloom, they could have kicked out all the glucan and now another organism has taken over. So keep in mind, glucans, they're stickier pectin, they're stickier polysaccharide, if you know you have a botrytis problem in the field, you are going to most likely have a glucan problem at filtration. We had a client on the central coast a couple of years ago call with a cross flow filtration problem. So it got kicked to me and we talked, it's a Pinot Noir on the coast, heavy botrytis infection. I said, so you need to go ahead and use a gluconase. And she said, okay, I'll use it. Um, will it be ready in a week? No, it takes about six weeks for a gluconase that we can use legally in the United States. Remember, we, we don't wanna be adding something. There's a lot of different enzyme activities that we can get from different base organisms. But um, in the US for gluconase, we typically get that from Trichoderma harzianum. In Europe, they're using a couple of different organisms that are not listed on our code of federal regulations. Um, so if you're using a gluconase from Trichoderma harzianum, it's gonna take about six to eight weeks, sometimes 10 weeks, dep depending upon the level of glucan issue to work. So this client called me back. Well, I spoke to one of your competitors and they told me their gluconase works in two to three weeks. Yes, ours does too on the yeast cell wall we're not using our gluconase for that issue. We're using it to deal with glucan from botrytis. That's a, that's a more potent issue and it takes more time to deal with. So be mindful of that when you have somebody tell you, oh, it works in three weeks. What is it working on, 
right? What is your gluconase working on and what do you need it to work on? Are you using it to break down cell wall or are you using it to break down glucan from botrytis infection or pediococcus? Um, a good time, this, this Central Coast winemaker, they now have implemented using our gluconase um, at the end of every malolactic fermentation. So this is where a good time to use a gluconase is at the end of malolactic fermentation on red. If you have a glucan problem in white and it's a white that's not going through malolactic fermentation, go ahead and use it at the end of primary fermentation. Um, you can stop it at any time with bentonite. If it's a white that's going through malolactic fermentation, I would use it at the end. You could technically use it before malolactic fermentation, but I'm a one process at a time girl. I don't want to have a question. Did that enzyme interrupt my malic fermentation? It probably didn't, but let's just keep them separate. The, you know, we've got time to bottle. We've got six weeks, right? We've got six weeks. We've got 12 months. We've got 18 months, depending upon the varietal. So be mindful of when you might use a gluconase in your winemaking process and what varietal you're using. And then lastly, um, enzymes for aromatic release are glycosidase, not a gluconase, a glycosidase. Remember releasing our bound terpene aromatics, Malvasia, some Sauvignon, some Viognier's. Um, they do great with this enzyme. It's super fun to bring a tired white wine back to life. Um, our friends, um, Adina brands have done some work and they're even using these um, glycosidases in Syrah. Um, so that's really exciting. So you can use them in, the, in a red wine too. Remember trials are needed. Um, it's, it's very important not just to add it to your tank and go, right? Once we add something to our tank of wine, you can't take it out easily. We can halt it with bentonite, um, but that's a lot of work in the cellar. So things to keep in mind. One point I haven't made yet is enzymes in our industry are not pure. pure purity is hard to select for. Um, the base organism actually matters. I didn't really understand this till I spent a week with one of our enzyme rats from across the pond and he explained it to me. He said, Maggie, remember our yeast strains? We all are using Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Um, but our friend D254 for making cab kicks out a lot of yummy glycerol for mouthfeel. But let's say we take something like BM4 by four, that's also used on red wine, but you're not gonna get the same sensory profile that you do from something like D254. So even though we're both using Saccharomyces, they have different attributes. And that's the same with our base organism strains for making enzymes. Um, one point that I, I really didn't consider um, was it's important to work with a manufacturer that owns its base organism and has control all the way through the process. Um, and, and so that's something to be mindful of. I, I hate to say it, but it's true. Price is kind of indicative of the quality of enzyme you're gonna get. If you just need something that's cheap and you just need a simple pectin depectinization, maybe you're okay going the cheaper route, but it's, it's an industry, right? There's movers and shakers. And I really like being associated with companies that have control over their base organism from beginning to end and that can create enzymes made for our market. Remember enzymes have multiple side activities. These side activities help us utilize what enzymes we want for specific purposes. Just like all those graphics that we looked at before, um, you know, enzymes for harvest, enzymes for wine, and right before filtration. Ah, yes, concerns with enzymes of the past and now. So I've got, I think, what I think is a cuneiform tablet from my art history days. I, I liked biology and I liked art history, go figure. And now we've got our tablet today. So in the past, enzymes were taken from the juice industry and um, they were not made for wine chemistry. So they did some negative things. 
we had some cinnamolesterase um, activity that created some vinyl phenol off aromatics and anthocyanase that created some loss of color in red wine. We don't have those issues anymore. Most distributors and manufacturers that are selling to the wine industry are going to make an enzyme to deal with wine chemistry. So remember I did say, there's no such thing as a perfectly pure enzyme. There might be one exception and that has to do with keeving in the cider world, but we're not talking about that today. In general, pectinases used in the wine industry are not pure. And we say that, but we can do enzymatic activity testing and we can see that these pectinases made for our industry have minimal to negligible levels. And sometimes we can't even see the enzyme activity level pop up on our measurement. But we also know in general, there's no such thing as pure enzymes. So keep that in mind. Um, not to be fearful of it. Like I said, I have never had anybody call me up after using any of our enzymes and tell me they've had a negative issue. Usually if they have had a negative issue, there's some other contributing factor. Um, so I think we've covered that. Let's just go through quickly enzyme benefit and process summary. So in fruit, Remember, I'm beating it into your head. In fruit, we want to extract juice, color, and aromatic precursors. We want to increase our yield. We're using enzymes to chop up that pectin chain to allow us to get to all the goodies in the grape. In juice, we need to depectinize for processes like flotation, or we just need some clarification to get our turbidity and percent solids down so we can make a specific style of wine. And that too also helps to increase our yield. In wine, we use enzymes to enhance sensory, for clarification, to make fining and filtration easier. Um, they really can be a good benefit in winemaking if we understand what enzyme we're using, how to use it properly, and what our winemaking goals are. So this is another graphic beating it into your head. Remember enzymes improve filtration. If you wanna improve your fining agent, right? And improve its target, get rid of the gunk. That also improves filtration. Here's our pectin net. Can't do much to reduce our solid load or our solid particles with a pectin net. We can dissolve that pectin net with our enzymes. We can drop a solid. Then we can add our fining agent. Our fining agent can actually attack its target flocculate down and sediment to the bottom of the tank. It's a really, really simple idea. Um, and it's just easy for me to talk about now because I've seen it again and again and again in the lab and I've heard success story after success story with my clients. So, you know, it's, it's a cool tool. And I think um, enzymes are often, they're just misunderstood and overlooked. Remember to be proactive. Don't wait till you get to filtration and you have a problem. Don't wait till you've added the bentonite and it's not settling out. Do some work up front to make your life easier downstream. We've got a lot of articles up on our website and we are always making new articles when I have the time, when my team has the time. We have a ton, a big, good technical team at Scott Labs and we're there to answer questions. That's what we do. It's it's fun. So that's a wrap. I hope um, this made sense, and I'm I'm open for questions. Wow! Thank you, Maggie. That's a lot of really really useful information you covered there. Um, really appreciate it. So, uh, thank you. Yeah, thanks for opening um, it up for questions. If you have a question, please type it into the Q and A box at this time. Um, and I guess to get things started, um, I had a question, Maggie, um, on average, and I know it's hard to generalize, but on average, what kind of uh, yield increase do you see with the use of? Um... Oh, oh, there you go. <laughs> I should know the answer. I would say 10 to 30 percent in general. You know, 10 to it's 30. That's a yeah. Lot. Yeah, it's a lot. I would say at least 10. I, it's hard to say, but I would say at least 10. 
Mm-hmm. And it depends on the grape. It depends on process. It depends, uh, you know, but if you can get more pulp, you get more juice out of the grape to begin with. I think some people are leaving um, money on the table if they just crush and press, especially some of those hard skinned grapes. I know Texas has some and I know the East Coast do. And just hearing back from clients, they've definitely increased yield. But the percent, I sh- I'll get back to you on that for sure. I will. Something that, yeah. yeah, I was curious about. And we have a question that I was going to ask as well. From okay. you recommend using multiple enzymes together? No. Well, ugh. so remember our enzymes are not pure. So if you are getting an enzyme with those side chain activities, you're probably getting some of the good basic enzyme activity. So really there's no reason to use multiple enzymes. There are some, so there are some situations. So we had a big Valley producer using their Sauv Blanc compress um, and they were adding a press enzyme. And so they did actually use a press enzyme and then they got to their settling tank and they just really needed a quick depectinization. They didn't have the time to wait. So they did actually end up adding a, a strong depectinizing enzyme. So they, they had the enzyme that helped them get more goodies from the grape. And then because they wanted something to settle extremely fast, they did add another pectinase on top of it. One that's basically for juice settling. So in some scenarios, I also had another huge facility use that same press enzyme, and they were using half the dose rate and getting settling in the time that they needed in just using the press enzyme and not using a settling enzyme. So it really depends on the grape. It depends on how what your processes are downstream and what level of depectinization you're looking for. Generally, I would say no. The one thing I would be mindful of, don't use a filtration enzyme at harvest, right? That, that is a mistake people have made because those are very potent and um, you'll get mush. And then you have to go to your feed store and buy rice holes so you have something to press against. Huh. That's, that's interesting. I, I I've done it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next question. Which form of enzyme has longer expiry? How do ah, liquid? Right, so liquid typically has the shorter expiry and you should always keep all your enzymes refrigerated if you can, that, ex- that keeps their expiry. And then granular, so some of the liquid enzymes that we sell have typically a three-year expiry and the granular has about a four-year expiry from the date of production. So just pay attention to your expiry dates on your enzyme packaging. The next question from Matt, are there interactions, deactivations of enzyme from SO2 and or alcohol? How rectify or adjust rate additions to compensate? So again, SO2 at the levels that we're adding, right? Don't add it at the same time. So in white juice, I know sometimes people are adding up to 150 ppm SO2. That's kind of on the extreme side. As long as it's homogenized in the juice, it's not gonna be an issue. Um, Our typical ads, 50, 60, not gonna be a problem. But again, don't add it at the same exact time as you're adding your enzyme. Let things get homogenized. And the second product, what was the second one? If, if If it does interact, uh, with SO2 and alcohol, oh. how would you adjust oh. the rate of addition to complement? Right. So alcohol in juice and wine is not going to be a factor. Um, but if we're talking about high proof, yes, enzymes are not going to be applicable to you. But in juice and wine, the manufacturer dose rate compensates for all those issues. Remember, we have legal limits of SO2. Um, Rarely do I see people getting up to those limits these days. In the past, I've seen it. But even those total SO2 levels are not going to be inhibitory in in wine or juice. And in juice especially, right? You can add 150 parts per million, and that gets bound up pretty quick, and it's it's not an issue. Thank you. Um, Next question from John. Um, How would you compare Rapidase to Lalzyme? Now, I don't know... 
<laughs> well, we saw both of them. These but... are my enzymes, so I can speak of them. Um, well, that's a good question because I asked our Ina Brands Rapidase rep, and he would not give me too much of an answer. So they have different enzyme activities. Um, they're, they're made a little bit different, right? It could be that the base organisms are different. Um, it could be one has, it depends. It depends on which lalzyme we're talking about and which rapidase we're talking about. But we sell both of them and I've trialed both of them in the lab and I, it, it depends. So we, we try and choose certain rapidase enzymes to fill the portfolio, right? And lalzyme enzymes to fill our portfolio. So we have some red macerating enzymes from lalzyme and we have our gluconase from lalzyme. From rapidase, we have a lot of our strong press and depectinizing enzymes. And then we also sell our scotzymes, right? So <clears throat> my thought is they're coming from different manufacturers, different base organisms, just like we sell lots of different yeasts, right? We've got our Lalamon strains, we've got our Firmavin strains, and we've got our anchor strains. So the base organism matters. So do a trial, right? I have a guy right now who's doing um, a Rapidase Revelation Aroma and a Scottsine BG Aroma trial to see the difference between the two and make a decision as to what enzymes. They're both um, glycosidases, right? To release those bound terpenes. And, and I said, oh, thank you. You're doing my job for me because I actually... <laughs> I haven't done the two um, because I'm, I'm one person. <laughs> I can't do everything. Thank you for that. Um, I don't see any more questions from our attendees, but I have one. Um, as you probably know, there's an issue with high pH wines in Texas. Does high yes. pH influence enzyme activity in any way? Well, it can in an indirect way. Right, so high pH, I've actually taken some phone calls from, from our Texas clients. Um, and a lot of times I think what's going on, and it's hard to prove because Texas is far away from me. Um, although I've visited three times and love that state, so much fun. Um, but I think what's happening is the high pH leads to microbial issues. And those microbial issues can kick off CO2 keeping things up in suspension. So it might be that the enzymes are actually working, but you can't see them working or settling things out because we've got fermentation that's kicking off. That's my gut thought, but there's no problem with high pH. In fact, higher pH might be more advantageous to enzyme activity. Our low pHs are one of the um, factors that keep our pectinase enzymes not reaching their full potential if they were used in other mediums. So, um, yes, a higher pH is actually better, but I think the perception is that because the high pH is happening, enzymes aren't working, and I think it has to do with microbial issues and CO2 output. Yeah, that, that would make sense. Thank you. Um, yeah. That's all the questions we have uh, so far, unless uh, something pops up. Mark says, thank you for the lecture. Um, and I second that. Thank you very much for all this super useful information. Um, thank you for taking the time to do this. To any everybody who attended, thank you for being here. Please, please, please take a minute to fill out the survey that's going to pop up once I end this uh, webinar. And with that, I wish you all a beautiful day. And I will see you next time. Thanks again, Maggie.